Welcome back. This is the fourth part of our series on testicular puzzles. And we're addressing now the question, is there really a great sperm race? Lots of sperm are ejaculated, but only need one to get to the site of fertilization. Is there a race to be that first one? Underlying this presentation is the concept that there are lots more sperm than there are eggs. With the human at each ejaculate, maybe 150 million sperm, and there's just one egg. So only one of those sperm is actually needed. So the key question is, why are there so many sperm? And along with that question are these questions. Is there actually a race to get there first? Does one sperm have to actually go really, really quickly to get there? How many males mate with a female? Is the competition between sperm? Whose sperm are they? Which male do they belong to? These are all things which happen within the female tract, and this is where we're going to go next. The first question is, where is the semen deposited? This is a diagram of the reproductive tract of humans, and we have the vagina, the cervix. In humans, there is just one uterine cavity. In most mammals, there are two separate uterine horns. Essentially, in humans, those two separate uterine horns have fused together embryologically. So there's one uterine cavity, but there are still two fallopian tubes, one on each side, entering into it, and the ovary should be here or here. So where is the semen deposited? Well, here's some data from a variety of species. Humans, where intercourse may be anything from two to 20 minutes, very variable. Uh, semen volume, ejaculate volume, one to five mils, where is it put? At the top end of the vagina. Ejaculation, essentially, the sperm are put onto the cap of the cervix. In the bull, very rapid. Just two seconds is all over. They ejaculate immediately, five to 10 mils into the vagina. Cats, a bit longer, 60 seconds, but tiny amounts, only 100 microliters or so, where into the vagina, but not everything ejaculates into the vagina. Boars, for instance, pigs. Boars, fairly long a period of uh, mating. Much, much larger volumes, 200 to 500 mils, half a litre, where it goes into the uterus. So the sperm have been deposited in the female tract, but actually quite a long way away at the moment from where the egg is. Why so many of them? Well, there are a number of answers to this question. The first one is, not every sperm is perfect. They're not all the same. It shouldn't be at all surprising that the semen can vary in its quality. At the individual sperm level, spermatogenesis is a very complicated process and things can go wrong. Uh, then as the sperm are produced and go down through the epididymis, there's various maturation processes that take place there and they can vary. When the sperm are ejaculated, numerous other fluids are added to the ejaculate. So you get variations in sperm count in the ejaculate. If you look at sperm morphology, then you have normal sperm, but you can have lots of abnormal sperm as well. And then you've got the key component of how the sperm actually swims in the female tract, sperm motility. Human semen quality is notoriously poor. This is looking at the percentage of sperm up on this axis with normal morphology. So they've got the right shape. This is what a normal sper human sperm looks like. So they looked at fertile fathers. So these are people who they knew were fertile. In fact, their time to pregnancy, here we are, was less than 12 months. So all of these males fathered children. So they're fertile males. And look at the percentage of sperm with normal morphology in their semen. It's down here, 10, 15% on average. Okay, it goes up a bit. There's quite a large variation. But in general, most of the sperm were not normal. What did they look like? All kinds of things. Big heads, small heads, two heads, two tails, etc. So relatively few normal sperm. All these other ones reflect problems in spermatogenesis and sperm maturation. And it isn't just the morphology which is bad. 
their ability to swim is bad as well. This is the percentage of sperm with normal motility in the same fertile fathers. How many can swim forward? Well, maybe 50% or so, 50-60%. Large percentage are no good. And semen quality changes with age. It goes down. Semen volume, concentration, count, motility, one swimming forward. This, this is percentage of the total sperm swimming forward. This, these are the total numbers swimming forward. And we can see that they all decline. And some of these declines are very rapid. These are log scales, log scale, log scale, log scale. So marked changes in semen quality with age. It's not good to begin with, but with age, it goes down even more. And this is looking at the likelihood of a semen sample being graded as clinically abnormal at various ages. Even at the age of 22, 25% of semen samples may be graded abnormal. By the time you get up to the age of 60, it's 85%. So a lot of sperm are no good to begin with. So the first answer to the question, why so many sperm is, not every sperm is perfect. Another answer is, they've got a very long and tortuous journey ahead of them within the female tract. Let's have a look at that. So let's look in humans again. Here we have vaginal deposition of the semen in humans onto the cervix. How many sperm? Well, 150 million of them, but they may not all be alive or motile like this little chap is. And what we see is that, in fact, a lot of them are actually lost straight away because they don't actually get into the cervix. 99% may be lost through what is known as retrograde transport, essentially not getting up into the cervix and dropping out through the vagina. But then the ones who try to get into the cervix, they've got a problem because they've got to penetrate the cervix, they've got to get through it. And the, in the cervix, there's a lot of mucus. And this essentially acts as a filter for sperm. Let's have a look. Cervical mucus is quite a complex mixture of water, salts and proteins. And it changes its characteristics as you go through the cycle. You can score the characteristics of cervical mucus artificially by looking at how much there is of it, how thick it is, how many cells are present, uh, it's ferning pattern, which refers to whether or not it actually forms crystallization patterns on slides and whether you can pull it out into long threads, spin barkite. Sometimes you can't, sometimes you can pull it into very long threads. Essentially, the characteristics of cervical mucus depend on how hydrated it is. When there's a lot of it, with a lot of water present, here we are, it's got a viscosity a bit like egg white, it's quite uh, watery. Uh, it's got very few cells present. It shows a lot of ferning, that is this crystallization pattern, and you can draw it out into great long threads. All of these occur at about mid-cycle, and that's when sperm can easily penetrate it. So this is the situation we have at mid-cycle. The watery egg white consistency Due to glycoprotein chains, heavily hydrated, a lot of water around, a lot of watery channels through which the sperm can swim. So this is essentially fertile mucus. The sperm can swim up through it. As that watery mucus becomes less watery, either before mid-cycle or after mid-cycle, then the sperm have more and more difficulty swimming through the chains. The water goes away, the chains become much more interlinked, and much more impenetrable. So this is infertile mucus. Mid-cycle, other stages of the cycle. So this is a picture of the typical fern-like pattern as the mucus dries. This is at mid-cycle when there's a lot of water around and you get this lovely crystalline pattern. It's called ferning. And this is spin barkite where you can pull the mucus up either between your fingers into long threads or a little bit more scientifically you put a drop of the cervical mucus onto a microscope slide, you attach a little cover slip on top and you lift it up and you see how far you can go. How many centimetres will this stretch out to? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, on you go. 
and you can do sperm penetration tests. Here is a drop of cervical mucus on the slide and sperm have been added to it and you can see the sperm are swimming up into the cervical mucus. You can do this again this a bit more scientifically. See how far they will swim up into cervical mucus in a tube. So here is a small sample of semen and this is a tube of cervical mucus and you dip the end of the tube into the semen and you see how long it takes them to get up into the cervical mucus. And here we can see a video of it. Here are sperm all swimming up into the cervical mucus. You can make out individual sperm. There's one there, there's one there, there's one there. All swimming up the channels in the mucus. Well, let's put the whole thing together in terms of the menstrual cycle. Here we have days of the menstrual cycle along here. So menstruation is occurring here. Mid-cycle is about here with ovulation. This is the next menstruation up here. And we're looking at the volume of cervical mucus being produced. Here we are. Volume goes up. Uh, it goes up and gets more and more till you reach a peak at mid-cycle. And then the volume goes down again. As that volume changes so that its viscosity changes becoming less and less viscous as you reach mid-cycle where you have the a lot of mucus with a raw egg white consistency. Post ovulation progesterone levels come in and the mucus becomes much thicker and much more rubbery highly uh, viscous and essentially impenetrable to sperm. So at mid-cycle where there's lots of it, very watery, the sperm can swim up the watery channels. Post ovulation, this thick, uh, highly viscous mucus is essentially impenetrable to sperm. So this is the fertile period when sperm can actually penetrate the mucus. Let's resume our journey now. So we've had the sperm deposited on the cervix here. 99% of them were lost through retrograde transport. They've managed to penetrate, at least some of them have. So this is acting as, going through the cervical mucus is acting as a filter for sperm which can't swim very well or are immotile or which are dead, and they get into the uterus. What happens in the uterus? Well, transport through the uterus, there may be a bit of swimming, but also there's contractions of the uterus, which is uh, mixing up the uterine contents. So sperm naturally, if they get into the uterus, will be mixed up and get up towards the top of the uterus. Within the uterus though, some of them are lost again through phagocytosis, but they get up to this area here and half may go that way, half may go that way. So again, sperm numbers are decreasing all the time and they have to go through here, the uterotubule junction, the junction between the uterus and the fallopian tubes. Here we see a picture of the uterotubule junction in a variety of species. Here we have humans, where this is the top of the uterus, going into the fallopian tube here, here's rabbit, uh, cattle, mice, ra rodents in general, dogs. And it is not just a simple tube. It isn't just like plumbing in a house. These are very uh, different kinds of structures. The fallopian tube is a very different structure from the uterus. And to get into the fallopian tube, you have to go through a very constricted area. And that constricted area, the constrictions are added to by the fact there's a lot of smooth muscle around. So it isn't like a big open pipework at all. There's control over what can get in to the fallopian tube from the uterus. Our understanding of that control is very, very poor. But it would be wrong to think of it just as a funnel. It is a selective in, uh, a selective intake of sperm from the uterus into the fallopian tube in all of these species. This complexity of the uterotubule junction and into the fallopian tube is well illustrated by various sections taken through the fallopian tube of humans. Here we are at the uterotubule junction and we can see it's a very complex lumen but that lumen just gets more and more complex as you go up through the fallopian tube with lots and lots of ciliated folds as you get up towards the area where fertilization takes place. And 
in the lumen is a lot of mucus again. Secretions produced by the fallopian tube, which again are going to influence what sperm can do within that structure. Well, let's just recap on our journey so far. Sperm were deposited here onto the cervix. 99% were probably lost in humans uh, down through the vagina. Some penetrate up through the cervical mucus. They are mixed up within the uterine lumen. Some, many, bind to the uh, uterine luminal epithelial cells. Some manage to get up through the very complex uterotubular junction into the very, very um, complex fallopian tube. And up here in the ampulla region is where they're going to find the egg and fertilization is going to take place. Well, let's see how many actually complete the journey. This is looking at the rough numbers of sperm at the site of insemination, wherever that is, in a variety of species, guinea pigs, uh, pigs, man, mice, rats, sheep. This is all in millions. And this is the number of sperm at the site of fertilization. And we can see that in, in basically, it's about one in a million actually get there. One in a million sperm. If we look at the same data in women, in a bit more detail, here we've got numbers of spermatozoa recovered from human fallopian tubes 8 to 15 hours after sex. Here are the number of women. Four women had no sperm at all. Six women had up to 100. Five women up to 1,000. Two women up to 5,000. Obviously a huge loss of sperm along the way. Let's go back to the original question. Why so many sperm? The first answer was there's a lot of imperfect sperm, either in morphology or motility or other characteristics. Secondly, they've got a very long journey ahead of them and many get lost on the way. And the third is they're distributed not only in space within the female reproductive tract, but they've got to be distributed in time as well. They've got to be at the site of fertilization at precisely the right time when an egg, which only has a very limited lifespan itself, is present. So sperm are distributed in time so that some of them at least can achieve fertilization. Here's a problem we're trying to deal with. Ovulation in humans, once a month, one egg. And once ovulated, it has a very short fertilizable life. It has to be fertilized within 24 hours, otherwise it'll just degenerate. So we've got to get sperm at the site of fertilization here, ready for when the ovulated egg with its surrounded mass of cumulus cells, by the time they get to the ampulla, the site of fertilization. So we need some fertile sperm there. But intercourse may be sporadic. No guarantee that it'll be exactly just before ovulation or just after ovulation. It could be one, two, three days beforehand. How are we going to ensure that sperm are going to be at the right place at the right time and in the right state to fertilize the egg? And the answer is, you've got to consider this. Is there some mechanism of storing the sperm within the female tract to allow at least some sperm always to be present at the site of fertilization when the egg eventually gets there? Sperm storage within the female tract is not a novel idea. Many species have it. Here we are, birds, turtles, alligators, lizards and snakes, lots of examples, and the sperm can last anything from seven days up to many years. Bats can store sperm within the female tract while they're hibernating over the winter. Here we've got uh, amphibia, newts, uh, salamanders, etc., from a few months to a few years. Sharks and rays, up to two years. So sperm storage is not a novel idea at all. Does it occur in humans? Well, we certainly understand sperm storage in birds. In chickens, 21 days they can be stored. Turkeys, up to 70 days. Where? In little sperm storage tubules, which come off between the vagina and the uterus, essentially in the position of the cervix of mammals. And these tubules are proper tubules lined by an epithelium with a lumen, and that lumen gets filled with sperm after mating. And that's where the sperm are stored and we can be slowly released. So one mating can produce sperm which can go on 
going up within the female tract, being released slowly for many, many days. So whenever there's an ovulation, then the sperm can be there present, at least some sperm can be there present to fertilise the egg. Well, certainly there's good evidence that sperm will survive within the human female reproductive tract for many days after intercourse. This evidence comes from data like this. We're looking at women who are trying to get pregnant and we're looking at here's a time course along here, ovulation here, and the probability of them getting pregnant depends on the day of intercourse. Intercourse after the day of ovulation, the chances of getting pregnant are very low. So you need to really have intercourse before the day of ovulation. How much before? Well, one, two, three, four, up to six days before ovulation. Intercourse here can still occasionally arrive, uh, produce a pregnancy. A couple of days before, very high success rate. So somewhere sperm are surviving for a couple of days before ovulation and then they're fertilizing the egg. So the question is where are the sperm surviving? Where are they being stored within the female tract? Some certainly will survive within cervical mucus for many days quite happily and from which they can go on being released. But maybe other things are going on higher up in the tract which facilitate fertilization of eggs released much later. There's good evidence now that sperm within the fallopian tube can act as a reservoir for sperm to fertilize the egg. What happens when sperm get up into the fallopian tube, and they can do it actually remarkably quickly, they can get there within uh, a few minutes of intercourse, but many of them then bind to the walls of the tube. So here's a very convoluted walls of the a fallopian tube, the sperm bind to the ciliated cells and then they can be slowly released over the next few days. Sperm can certainly get to the fallopian tube where fertilization is going to take place within just a few minutes of intercourse. Some may take longer but they can get up there very quickly. So why is there such a delay between the sperm getting there and the optimal time for fertilization? Trying to understand the relationship between sperm present in the reproductive tract and the timing of ovulation led to experiments like this. And these type of experiments were really pioneered by two major workers, Chang in the States and Austin in the UK. And this is a typical experiment. This was working in rabbits and this was the timing of ovulation in rabbits, which could be controlled very precisely. So this is hours after fertilization, this is hours before fertilization, and sperm are being injected into the fallopian tube of rabbits either before or after, after ovulation to see whether fertilization would take place. So here we are, percentage of fertilization. Sperm injected eight hours before, six hours before, good fertilization rates. But as you got closer to the time of ovulation, fertilization rates went right down to zero and injecting the sperm into the fallopian tube after ovulation was no good at all. Now, 70 years later, capacitation is still a fairly poorly understood process. The term just reflects the requirement that sperm must be incubated in some way for some hours before they acquire the capacity to fertilize an egg. In vivo, this occurs within the female reproductive tract, or you can do it in vitro. What do we know about it? but it's time dependent and the time required is species specific. In humans, the estimates are very variable, anything from three to 24 hours minimum time. What does it involve? Well, material seems to be added to the sperm as we've already seen as during their passage through the epididymis and capacitation involves the loss of at least some of those materials cholesterol, glycose, aminoglycans, glycoproteins, a number of materials are lost from the sperm surface and there's reorganization of the what's left in the sperm membranes. This though is a reversible process, certainly in vitro. If you add the sperm back, having been capacitated, if you add them back then to seminal plasma, they become decapacitated again. So a reversible loss of materials. A very good review is here um, in uh, Human Reproduction 8, uh, update in 2017. 
Well, we might not understand the process very much, but we do understand what the process actually leads to. One of the major things is that sperm can change their motility. They become hyperactivated. So this, these are two pictures of the sperm. This is before hyperactivation. This is after hyperactivation. The numbers refer to sequential pictures. 20 milliseconds apart. So in this situation before hyperactivation, they're just swimming forward. Here, the sperm are rotating as well as not swimming forward nearly as much. They're sort of more, much more going around in circles. Hyperactivated, much more frenzied swimming. You can see this from the tracks of the sperms. Here, they're not hyperactivated and they're just progressing essentially forward. Here, they're rotating around and much more frenzied changes in direction. Hyperactivated motility. What's the significance of this hyperactivated motility? Well, one thing it may do is to release or help release the sperm from their binding to the luminal epithelial cells of the fallopian tube. So the sperm have come up, entered the fallopian tubes. Some of them are binding onto the epithelium. Hyperactivation changes the motility and off they swim. It may also help them penetrate the egg investments later on. But capacitated sperm can do something else. They can also undergo the acrosome reaction. And the acrosome reaction is essential for penetration of the egg investments themselves. What does it involve? Well, the acrosome is an enzyme filled cap at the head of the nucleus. So what we have is if we go from the outside inwards, we go, have the outer sperm membrane, then the outer acrosomal membrane, then we have the acrosome itself, then we have the inner acrosomal membrane, then we go inside and we find the nucleus and at the end we've got the tail. The acrosome reaction involves a fusion of the outer sperm membrane with the outer acrosomal membrane, essentially allowing the inner acrosomal contents to have access to the outside world, releasing the enzymes on the inside. These enzymes are then free to penetrate the egg investments and the sperm can go through. So you end up with this situation where the sperm head, instead of being at the front of it being the outer sperm membrane, you've got the inner surface of the original acrosome, often with enzymes attached. So at the start of this whole section, we said, is there a great sperm race? Is there competition between sperm? Whose sperm are they? And we've seen that within the female tract, it's very complicated. They can't be just first gets their wins because sperm take a long time to get there. They need to undergo capacitation. The selection of sperm as you go through the female tract, that gives rise to the possibility that there is competition between sperm and some sperm from some males are better than others. And if you want to do some more reading on this, then a very good series of articles has just come out uh, in December 2020, uh, 50 years of sperm competition uh, and a whole series of papers. Here are three very good ones. Conceptual developments in sperm competition, a very brief synopsis by one of the key workers in the field, Jeff Parker. This one, which deals both mice and women with a perspective of what's going on within the female tract. And this one, another very good review by Tim Burkhead, who's been working on this subject in birds for many years. So that's in the Philo Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, Series B. Um, you can find it online and there's a whole series of articles which uh, are well worth reading and following up on. It really does challenge our understanding. OK, that's it for this section. We've now got the sperm very close to the site of fertilisation. In the next section, we'll see what happens next. Thanks for listening.